Hey everyone! Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. Instead of sharing a birth story, I'm chatting with Katie B, and she's sharing with us her story about her journey with postpartum anxiety. Katie bravely opens up about her experiences after both her births, the significant anxiety she experienced, and how she managed it and got through to the other side. She also shares a little bit about a project that she started that helps her manage her mental health and helps her give back. We'll get into the podcast episode right after this quick message. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are doctors Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates, and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. Hey, Katie, welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to share my story and be here. Oh, I'm, and I'm really glad that you reached out to us. So Katie is here today to share with me uh, her story and her journey with um, postpartum anxiety and depression. Yes, it's something that I feel very passionate about sharing my story. And because I know in the deepest, darkest moments of it, you feel like you're the only one Mm -hmm. in the world that's going through it. Mm -hmm. And all I wanted was somebody to say, I know exactly how you feel. I've been there. And I didn't know that. I I thought that I was the only person that was feeling this scared and panicked and sad and depressed and for no reason because everything in my life was fine. Everything was going well. I had successful C-sections. Everything was good. And then it just hit me and it really, I literally woke up one morning and I couldn't get out of bed. And I was like, what is happening? And it was absolutely terrifying. And I knew a lot about postpartum anxiety, depression. And I actually remember in the early stages of bringing home my daughter, my second child, scrolling through Instagram and Facebook and feeling really triggered by any posts about postpartum anxiety or depression. I would get like this quick moment and then I'd quickly scroll past it. And I wasn't in it yet, but I remember that. And then it was like, that was the slow build up to the day that I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not okay. I need help. Do you mind sharing with us a little bit about your, mm-hmm. your journey with your first, you don't have to go into details around your birth, how that, you mentioned that might've triggered some of perhaps your initial experience yeah. with firstborn. Yeah. So with my first, I didn't, I didn't have this kind of panic, but it was just the immediate kind of bringing home your baby Mm -hmm. and you're feeling scared and you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? I have a child all of a sudden. And the first mom, like the first time mom kind of worry that comes with it. And I did, I remember constantly worrying about him getting sick or catching up cold or just like anything, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't, I wasn't stuck in it. Like it would pass. And then And I have, I do have a history with anxiety. So I was, come on, Katie, snap out of it. You're good. Everything's fine. But then when I had my second child, that was when it started again down that same path. But it wasn't necessarily the worrying about my kids. It was worrying about myself. Like, I'm crazy. Something's wrong with me. Am I going to be able to be there for my kids? So it was a totally different feeling, really intense feeling that I had never felt before. And I think that's why it scared me so much. So two completely different experiences with both kids, but obviously all under the umbrella of Mm -hmm. of postpartum anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But with your first, it sounds like you had the normal, I'm doing quotations here, the worry. And I always say it's normal to worry until it interferes with your function. But did you ever need to seek any treatment or support or you were able to manage that on your own and with the help of your partner and family? Yeah. 
totally. I managed really well. I remember around six months, um, I postpartum it was, that was, I guess, three years ago when there was like a reoccurrence of measles. <laughs> oh my gosh. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You no, know, I didn't because I remember that terrifying me yeah. and being like, oh my gosh. Okay. Like we were going to go away for that spring break. And I remember it, my anxiety starting to increase mm -hmm. around the reoccurrence of resurgence of some measles cases. And then I was like, okay, well, can I get him like vaccinated early and all this trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to do all that just to, to cope with that anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I remember around that mark, I was like, I called my, my family doctor and I explained, I'm feeling really anxious about my child's health. Mm -hmm. That was what it was more of like health anxiety, mm -hmm. almost like a self preservation type thing. Cause I knew that what comes with your kid being sick is like lack of sleep, like lack of all yep. these other things. So I think I was just constantly trying to protect myself from maybe anything escalating mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But then I came out of that and I was fine. So it was but, in moments. Yeah. And then yeah. with your second, and that's your daughter, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How were things immediately following the birth with her? So immediately following the birth, everything went fine as far as the birth like it mm -hmm. was it was fine and I remember coming home after my c-section and I don't do really well with the pain medication so I had the same immediate panicky feeling right after mm -hmm. I had her mm -hmm. and I remember the next day after my after I had been sent home from the hospital going back to the emergency and being like something's wrong with me like I'm feeling terrified I was super achy and I don't know if it was related to the medication, but I remember just feeling really scared. And then once I came off all of the pain meds and everything after surgery, I remember feeling a lot lighter mm -hmm. around like two, that two week mark after a C-section and you start getting a little bit more mobility back and just feeling, okay, I got this. So then I was fine for several weeks mm -hmm. and then around seven weeks postpartum, that's when all of a sudden it just hit me and I remember mm -hmm. starting to get panic attacks like I I remember I had my son in the car mm -hmm. with me the baby was at home with my husband and I just went to the grocery store with my son and we were driving home and I got this panic attack like oh my looking back where's the baby mm -hmm. where's the baby and then I was like she's at home the second baby's at home everything's fine but I think it was that initial like holy crap I have two kids now and then that's where I started having those panic attacks and then followed the panic attacks I just started worrying about my mental health and mm -hmm. kind of deep diving trying to self-diagnose myself what is mm -hmm. wrong with me am I developing bipolar do I have postpartum psychosis just mm -hmm. completely going off the deep end with grabbing to onto any source of information I can to self-diagnose myself mm -hmm. which is really scary Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information out there. The internet will tell you whatever you want it to. Yeah. And I think that was also what wasn't good for me is, and there's so many amazing accounts like yours. She found motherhood that, that really advocates for women and their prenatal, postnatal health and everything, which is awesome. But I think I just knew, almost knew too much yeah. about what could go wrong. I know. And that's where it took me was just like severe panic and then panicking about myself so it was like became the fear of fear yeah that's what it turned into so something not even related to my kids or anything and it's um, interesting you share that because I think you're right on social media most of the symptoms are worrying about your kids so then mm -hmm. worrying about your own health drives further the fear and the worry that there's yeah. something unique and different and yes even more concerning because you're like my yeah. worry isn't like other people's so what's wrong with me yeah. And that was a huge part. It was like, okay, I'm not worrying Yeah, about my kids or something. This is like, something is wrong with me. Something is wrong in my brain. Something has clicked and I'm not myself. So that was pretty terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when I was like, okay, I need to really reach out to my doctor, my parents, just pull on all my supports. And I remember just constantly seeking, wanting answers. Mm -hmm and wanting to know, okay, well, what, what's wrong with me? What is this? And I remember my dad saying, like, this is also just a feeling. It, it's just a feeling. And 
it's going to go away with time, with medication, with whatever, because each circumstance is different. Mm -hmm. But I remember just wanting that feeling just to disappear because it made me feel sick. I couldn't eat. I was nauseous all the time, upset stomach. I think in that first few weeks, I had lost like maybe 20 pounds. Wow. Which was like all my pretty much like pregnancy weight, but we're part of it. But it just kind of like, because I couldn't eat and I couldn't drink. And I remember my mom bringing me like toast and tea in bed and the tronation, Katie, you need to eat, you need to eat. I couldn't, like it was awful. And then not to mention like juggling having a second child at home and feeling so guilty that you can't be with them because you're trying to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And my doctor was always saying, you have to take care of yourself first before you can, you know, take care of your kids. You're the most important person here right now. And I remember just being like, oh my gosh, I am, this is so selfish of me. What am I doing? Snap out of it. I know it's, we're so, (laughs) we're so harsh to ourselves, but if your best friend was experiencing something like that, you'd be saying something completely different. I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like you have to take your own advice sometimes which is hard when it's happening to you. It is hard. So how did you get through your journey? So the journey, I ended up going to Victoria from Nanaimo. So staying with my parents for six weeks with the baby and kind of my husband was going like back and forth. We're both teachers. So it happened at a good time and that it was right around spring break. And so he had the two weeks and then he could take a few days here and there. But yeah, so he was going back and forth with our three-year-old at the time between Nanaimo and Victoria. And my, that was my safe place was in my, the house I grew up in having my mom and dad. I just wanted my dad to hold me. That's all I wanted was just like a hug from my dad. He was like my safety person Mm -hmm. that I just I could talk to and he would take me for walks and just have to get out the house, mm-hmm. have to mm-hmm. set a plan each day, almost like behavioral stuff. What are you going to do today? Go for a walk. Try to get up. Don't sleep until 2 p.m. You have to just get up, and which was really hard because it does feel impossible when you feel that low and that anxious. So yeah, I was there for six weeks. My doctor in Nanaimo was amazing. He did weekly check-ins with me because I had started medication as well mm-hmm. to to help. Mm-hmm. And that was really hard for me to start medication. I don't know why. I just really didn't want, I thought I could do it. I'm like, I can do this by myself. But I think the point where I was at, I needed, definitely needed that more of a medical intervention. And then eventually my parents were like, Katie, you can do this. <laughs> You need to go home and be with your family and get confidence back Mm -hmm. in yourself because Mm -hmm. I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust my brain. I was like, if it can snap like that and do what it's doing, then I'm scared to be alone with my kids. And I thought that I, you know, would just do something crazy. And that was my fear. That's why I didn't want to go home and be by myself. So we made a plan. And I think that was really important was to have that plan in place that I knew when I go home, I still have my supports. My parents Mm -hmm. are a phone call away. My husband is a phone call away when he's at work. My mother-in-law, I don't know what we would have done without her because she moved from Quebec last year. And so she was a huge help just with the kids and juggling all of that. But yeah, once I got home, I just started getting in a routine started slowly feeling better and even even now to this day there's still days where I catch myself being like that constant self-checking and am I okay today what's today going to be like but learning how to deal with that and work through it has been a game changer and just being like go away anxiety not Mm -hmm. today Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah we call our kids one of my one of my children has some pretty significant anxiety and there's a Disney our Pixar movie. Is it Luke? Luca? Oh, yeah. 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 And Bruno yeah. is his like anxiety voice. And we're like, yeah. tell Bruno to go away. Yeah. And it's, it's so true. Totally. Because when you get that feeling and everyone's version of anxiety, mm-hmm. that feeling you mm-hmm. get, it, it can be very different. But I know that when I get it, sometimes I'll acknowledge it and be like, and not to give it power. Like I'll carry on and mm-hmm. try to do something else, hop on the spin bike or do mm-hmm. a little laundry, something just totally normal mm-hmm. um, really helps and and planning, planning out what I'm going to do that day. Mm-hmm. And I think too, just as being a teacher, like I am so plan oriented. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's you are. yeah. it becomes um, easy for me. So 
that's been very helpful. Yeah. And I tried the counseling route, but that was tough for me because nothing happened. Mm -hmm. There was nothing Mm -hmm. that went wrong. It was just a feeling that I wanted to go away. So through the therapy, it, it almost brought everything up again for me. And I was like, I don't, I just want to move on. I want to go back to my old life. I want to be my old self. I don't want to think about this anymore. Um, I need to move away from it. So I I tried the counseling and I'm sure it's great for some people, but I just kind of needed to move away and not focus on it. Cause that's what the anxiety was being hyper-focused on myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard. Hey, I had as I mentioned before I started recording, I had really yeah. significant anxiety with my first, not so much yeah. my second and third, but it's because I started taking yeah. ads postpartum immediately. Yeah. But it's just paralyzing. It is paralyzing. Completely paralyzing. And then you have this, there is still so much stigma around mental health. And those of yeah. us who are educated and you come from a family, a, a parent with a, as a physician, like mental health is a disease, just like cancer, just like diabetes. And would you ever mm-hmm. say, oh, I can do this to cancer? No, yeah. you, would, you would do all of the appropriate therapies. But when it comes to mental health, we just think the same thing. We should be able to get, I should yourself. And um, totally, especially postpartum. Sometimes not everyone needs medications, but when it's this, like it's, it's impairing you so much. Medication can get you to that point where you can go outside and do the things yeah. like the walking and the the normal every day to day activities that are going to start to help you feel better. Yeah, absolutely. And even reaching out to you and wanting to speak out about my experience, I was like, oh my gosh, what if you know my colleagues hear it, which I'm sure that they will. And yeah. and what if they think I'm crazy and then I'm not capable to work with kids or and I'm like, why am I, why am I doing that? Yeah. It's not, I'm sure so many people deal with mm-hmm. maybe even worse things and don't talk about it. But I was feeling it's a vulnerable thing to share your story. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I'm like, no, I have to do this because women going back to work after having kids need to know that there's so much that comes with it. And mental health is probably like the number one thing that you need to take care of through that to be able to be to focus on something other than your job and even when you are a full-time working mom you're still like in a sense that stay-at-home mom because you're like the the mom's always like the organizer the driver of everything that mm-hmm. you just have so much like there's just so much on your plate at all times and it's a really hard thing and I just want <laughs> Women to know that going back to work, having kids, yeah, it's awesome. It's rewarding, but it's okay for it to be hard and it is hard. And I just feel so strongly about, yeah, sharing that message. Oh, it's so true. I recently actually had to close my family practice because yeah. I've been struggling. We've had a lot of childcare, so I have three. Yes, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. And next year they'll all be in school, but it was just too much. And I was just, I was putting myself last and not taking care of myself. And Alicia and I had this conversation because we're very close and we work together. And the practice I had was at our clinic. And we said, we have evolved as a culture and as a society that we often live away from our immediate family, right? So our parents and our aunties and our cousins don't all necessarily live in the same city. And now we've also evolved that most families have two working parents in order to live um, and thrive in this very commercial society we have and so you have two working parents but you're away from your supports like we need to do better in terms of support not to mention right now oh in a pandemic throw that in there no big deal Yeah, just throw it in but it's so true and then not to mention finding child care oh my gosh paying for child care like yeah. i'm like how are like how are women even supposed to you know go back to work full-time in this kind of situation just there's so many layers and I think the more that we talk about it we're like okay I'm not the only one yeah yeah it's really hard yeah and and it's that's okay but sometimes we do need more support than yeah. families our doctors I don't know I'm hoping for some change <laughs> mm-hmm. oh my god the way our yeah. society is built um fairly soon here I'm I'm really hoping for that because it's just it's weighing heavy on everybody Yeah, it is. And I think social media is great in some senses, but also it can be really harmful. It's highlight. 
So you see, yeah. And I know like my personal feed, sometimes I look at it, I'm like, oh my God, my life looks perfect, but it's not. Yeah. Like I didn't share that mm-hmm. my kids screamed for an hour because I wouldn't let them watch TV and I don't share that. Yeah. They don't eat dinner because blah, blah. And so yeah. you see everybody's social media sharing their perfect yeah. life and thinking, what's wrong with me? Yeah. And thinking too, okay, no, there should be no screen time. We're going to do baby led weaning. Okay. We're going to do sleep train. Uh, We're going to all these things that Mm -hmm. like we know and because there's that they're all well-researched things, Mm -hmm. but okay. How are we? (laughs) What? Like, it's just so it's like information overload and, and I'm guilty of it too. Like I follow all of those accounts as well like sleep training stuff and Mm -hmm. how to feed your baby the what do they call it the gentle parenting all this stuff and I'm like but then it makes you even harder on yourself because when you lose it on your kids you're like oh my gosh I'm supposed to validate their feelings and (laughs) and do that yeah so it's just it's a lot it's a lot of pressure it is a lot and I think just Having conversations like this and getting the message out there that normalizes you're a teacher, I'm a physician and it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And 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 being a full-time stay-at-home mom, I don't think it's any easier because we're still, no. still lacking all the support, but you don't have that, you know, work is I always say when I am at work, it's almost easier. Right? It is easier me going to work and having 28 kids to look after than being at home all day with both my kids. Mm-hmm. Like honestly, to me, that is way easier because mm-hmm. you're not carrying that extra load of the family stuff and mm-hmm. yeah and you're you're focusing on something else you're not yeah. it's it's nice like it's refreshing to be doing something else which is why throughout all of this anxiety and depression I because before my second child I used to do I used to do a lot of trail running and I mm-hmm. did like trail ultra and I run you know marathons to, I was running a ton when the pandemic hit I was training for an ultra and then it got canceled and then I ended up getting pregnant with my second I think I've gone for two runs Mm -hmm. since I've had my second baby and she's 13 months old now and then I finally just bought a a home spin bike because it's like I need something that's easy I can just throw a sports bra on some running shoes and get a good sweat on because that's Mm -hmm. what I needed yeah and then also with the 27.4, the bracelets, it was just that nice um, creative outlet that you're hyper-focused on something. I also started sewing lessons once a week. Because I'm just kidding. Yes, I just wanted to thing. learn a skill. Yeah. I wanted a skill and it's like artists and when you're, you get in like that, that mode where nothing else, everything melts away, which is so nice to have where you're, it's so detailed that you're focusing so much on that, that you're not thinking about yourself or what can go wrong, or if your kids are sick, or if you're going to have childcare the next day, or if just everything. All the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's so true. It's a, and, it's a form of mindfulness, right? Yes, it yeah. is. And I needed that so much and running used to be like my huge self-care but now I find because you're just with yourself unless I'm running with a friend chatting the whole time but usually when I'm running in the trails or I'm by myself thinking in my head Mm -hmm. which I don't want to be yeah having that creative outlet has been really nice because I can't get in my own head and it's like a bit of escapism for me to do that yeah good for you for finding that everyone knows the best gifts are the ones that you buy for yourself but how can you get that exciting gift opening surprise factor while also getting yourself exactly what you need with a nesting box of course a pregnancy themed subscription box filled with locally crafted ethically sourced goodies handpicked by doctors sarah and alicia to support you in whatever trimester of pregnancy you're in from soothing soaks and balms for those first trimester aches and nausea to newborn products for when your baby arrives. We have you, or the pregnant person in your life, covered. Go to www.shefoundhealth.ca backslash the-nesting-box or click the link below. Tell me, yeah. tell, share a bit about your bracelets. You sent us some. So, I'm gonna share about, I'll share about them. Out. Yeah, so the bracelets just started as I don't know. I actually don't. It started, I think, in the summer. And 
I was like, oh, I really want like a cute beaded bracelet that says like mama or some just something that I can look at my wrist and there's a nice little reminder for me to be present or to get out of my head. Just, mm-hmm. just I just wanted, I saw, I think something on online and I was like, oh, that's really cute. I can make it myself. So I went to a craft store and I just started making some and I was like, oh, these are so cute. And then I just, and then as I was actually beading, putting tiny beads on a string and tying tiny knots, I was like, this is very soothing. Yeah. (laughs) This is awesome. Yeah. So then I just got hooked on making these. And then I just thought it'd be cool to share why I'm doing this and how it's helping me. And then I just turned into nothing. It's nothing big, but it's just something that I'm excited about because the more people order them or whatever it's just spreading the story of women's mental health and then I sent uh partial proceeds of anything there's not not making really anything but the proceeds I sent to Pacific Postpartum Society yeah so I donate a little bit there and then during Christmas time I made these kind of self-care kits for people living on the streets and some special ones for women for like period the pads and that kind of stuff because I was like what do women do that live on that are homeless I know I don't have access and then what also used to really upset me about my whole condition was I am so privileged I have a roof over my head I have a supportive family Mm -hmm. I have my health I have everything I what what do women do that don't Mm. have that and that are going through postpartum anxiety or depression that might not even have a partner in it with them. And I was like, would they just walk into the emergency room with their baby and be like, help me? I, I know. I just, it really opened my eyes and gave me just such a perspective into what people go through that is so terrible and so hard. And I think that's been a gift in all of this is that before I'd be like, oh, that's sad. That person is depressed like that sucks but now when you've been through something mm-hmm. like that you feel it like it, I've become such an empath where like every feeling I have yeah. it's so intense mm-hmm. and I just want to give everything to anyone that struggles yeah so that's been a real silver lining to all of this is I'm like oh my gosh there's so much more we can do to help yeah you know? yeah and I think just normalizing the experience and realizing how freaking resilient women are Right. Hey, women are badass. Like they are, they are super women. Like yeah. I just cannot believe what we do, even just from a biological sense to working full time, raising kids, doing everything. And, and that's even with supportive partners. Mm-hmm. And then not to mention people that go through IVF and all that kind of oh, stuff my that gosh. is just a whole other thing. And it's just, it's incredible what women do or people with the uterus do. And Mm -hmm. it is, yeah, mind blowing. I've really just been like, holy crap, this is, we are super people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We sure are. And like, shout it from the rooftops, man. Like, sometimes I'm like, we are superior people. Yeah, but like, (laughs) men are awesome too. But like, we are. It's funny because I have three boys. And they'll yeah. say like something in it. Oh, it's not fair. And I was like, oh, just you wait, you three white privileged males. Like they're exactly. the most privileged people on the planet, white men. And I'm raising yeah. them. And I'm like, and yeah. my, one of my kids was like, oh, we're so lucky. And I was like, you are so privileged. There's a difference. Yeah, I know. And I know. And I'm thankful I have a son because I'm going to raise him to be yeah. such a woman worshiper because... <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe that's so that maybe the hopefully that generation will become is more of sensitive to yeah. women's needs. And then I have the most supportive husband. He's amazing. But sometimes I'm like, you will never understand. It doesn't matter how much I'm open with you or tell you or whatever. Like you're never going to get it. And so that's, that's, um, it's yeah, hard. The tough yeah. part. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And it is hard. And I think anybody, when we're using the word woman and mother, but lots of, there's a yeah. proportion of people who don't identify as a woman, but they still yeah. carry pregnancies and birth. And I think it's those of us who experience those changes, who carry and grow a life and birth. Yes. No matter what yeah. form of birth, you cannot put into words that experience. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. that, the responsibility yeah. that you feel 
caring for those beings that you have grown. Yeah. And I, I have someone very close to me that is going through the process. They're in a same-sex relationship of deciding who's going to go first mm-hmm. with carrying a child and then who's going to go second. So it's two women. And I remember saying to her, I was like, you know what? It, when both of you have a child, it's going to be so amazing because you're both going to understand totally. each other 100% in your partnership. Mm-hmm. Like it, what a gift. And so it's, well, there's pros and cons, obviously, because it's the whole process of, that's a whole other can of worms mm-hmm. that I don't want to open. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's all a situation and it's all hard. And I just want, um, I want people just to open up about it and to totally normalize prenatal, postnatal, everything. I don't even know how long postpartum is technically considered, but I remember thinking I'm on a timeline. Okay, I have to get to a year postpartum. Yeah. If I'm still anxious and depressed, then I'm just anxious and depressed. Yeah, like that's think, just me. I think it lasts for our whole <laughs> lives, right? Honestly. I know. And right? I was like, aren't you just postpartum forever after yeah. you have a child? <laughs> I think basically. Why do we need to just to define and distinguish? Yeah. Yeah. So your bracelets are 24-7, right? Do you have a like yes. a Instagram account or, or 27-4? 27-4. Yes. Yeah. 27-4. Play on 24-7. Yeah. 27 is like this weird number that is just so present in my family, like my husband and I and my kids. There's so many reasons. Like the number 27 just keeps coming up. 27 and then four as an F-O-R. Mm-hmm. Because what I thought was what I'm trying to do is any anything that I make uh, from the bracelets I want it to be for someone else so Mm -hmm. just showing 27 our family in support of like we are for whatever the cause and right now I'm focusing on yeah maternal mental health because it's obviously you know what I'm going through right now but it's open-ended it can we're in support of everything and yeah so yeah that's the the reason why I called it that. And mm-hmm. if, yeah, people, if people people want to um support your bracelets, how can they find yeah. you? So I am on Instagram twenty seven four okay. at twenty seven four okay. as in written out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll tag. We'll put it on our show. <laughs> yeah, we'll put it in our show. Uh, yeah, and then there's a link in my bio that takes you to like a little what is it called like Square Space yeah. type of site, or yeah. you can just message me through there. And I can do custom stuff. If there's anything you already like on the page, I can read you that. Yeah. And I have access to all different kinds of beads, letters. Yeah. So that's how you can get me. And then I don't know who my next kind of charity proceeds will go to, but that's always open. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for reaching out and for your story and normalizing the incredible challenge that postpartum can be. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm very excited to be able to share about that and hope that anyone that's listening to this feels a sense of relief that they're not the only one and that there is so much support out there. Yeah. Yeah. There is. And I see you. I know how you feel. <laughs> mm, thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.